Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation with Tom Merritt and Leo Laporte. Episode 24, recorded September 14th, 2011. John Perry Barlow. It's time for Triangulation, the show that we, uh, we I love doing probably perhaps the most because we get to get somebody who's really smart, a great thinker, bring them in, and Tom Merritt and I will sit down and talk to him and kind of pick his brain. And I just, this is the show where I learn the most. Tom Merritt, good to Absolutely see you. Absolutely agree. Good to and be here. And let us welcome Wild Turkey Fueled, Mr. John. <laughs> John <laughs> not, Perry not at the moment, right? <laughs> oh, we've got to fix I, that lower third. I, it's not the, Don uh, Tab Scott on there. Really so. smart uh, guy that you were. Uh... <laughs> you are the really smart okay, guy. Okay, well. Actually, you know, um, uh, uh, most recently My saw you. It was made for picking. There you go. At TEDx uh, Marin, where you did just a fire rousing talk about the internet and how it's changing the world and how we better get off our asses because they're going to take it away from us. I just thought that was great. And I think the people went out of there. You were the last speaker, uh, all charged up. Yeah, well, you know. Anything you can do to charge up people from Marin is... <laughs> <laughs> Let's go have quiche yeah, and some right, white wine exactly. and talk about this. Right. <laughs> Usually they get charged up when they run out of brie. <laughs> this is, I tell you how much of a big thinker you are. This is your second appearance on Triangulation. This time yeah, in person. I, I feel more triangulated. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You're right. You're stuck in the middle. Uh, just back from uh, Burning Man. I am. You've gone, and you uh, go every year? You said, you said well, it was less I, burning this year, too. Well, it was just, it was Burning Man light. You know, it was very, very pleasant out there on the playa. So Smoldering now, man. Now we have 20,000 you know, newbie burners who are going to come back thinking that it's a really cool place to be and nothing horrible ever happens. The weather was very good. The I weather guess. was excellent. The playa was the best I've seen it in many years. It was, the whole thing was like a, you know, like a runway. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hard and no dust. And what brings you back every year? Oh, I guess I just don't have enough natural disasters in my life. <laughs> <laughs> they I mean, say that that's part of it is oh, how hard it is to live it's there. It's the intentional complexity movement. Right. You know, it, I think, you know, people need uh, a sense of urgency. Yeah, the, we're complacent. We're so, we're, well, but I mean, it's just people need a sense of connection, which doesn't, which doesn't form very well unless you've got shared purpose that has some urgency around it. And, uh, you know, trying to... Trying to organize the unorganizable under adverse conditions is really a good way to breed a sense of human connection. That's uh, interesting. I never even really... I mean, it really, it, it, it is intentionally an unnatural right. disaster. Right. And that, it's, 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 we've all observed that when things go bad, that's when the human... Yeah, people pull together and spirit spirit put yourself exactly. in that community necessity organ, uh, situation. But I, you know, I go mostly now because it appeals so strongly to my sense of irony. <laughs> you know, I mean, you've never seen such bureaucracy. <laughs> What's well, a grown city, up like isn't it? crabgrass yeah. in the space of of this intentional anarchy? They have a police force, they oh, have a fire department. They have they have bureaucracy that is you know exceeds the federal government and includes the federal government. So is anyone studying that? Well, that's a know, great micro. I'm, I'm, I'm studying it in a very uh, sure. anecdotal way, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a what happens is that you get. An unwillingness on the top to create process. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't have the same kind of architectural systems that, that we had in the Internet, which was a wonderful place. Because engineers for, built it. For, yeah, right. For bureaucracy to be eliminated right. by the architecture. Right. Uh, so there are all these opportunities for former hall monitors to suddenly insert themselves mm -hmm. in the middle of a flow and start creating procedure. Uh, and there's nothing, there's nothing inherently there to say, no, 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 you can't actually do that. Uh, I mean, I, I ran into a number of cases this year where somebody was being a, a little tin dictator, and it wasn't like I could drive down to center camp and tell Larry that there was right. a, an overly assertive burner uh, in a critical location because he would say, well, yeah, so what did you do about it? Right. <laughs> right. That's interesting. So a lot, so... You almost need an anarchist constitution if you're going to have anarchy. Yeah. And, you and need that, rules. And that, that's that becomes really syndicalism. Difficult. <laughs> yeah. you know? No kidding. Isn't that what Noam Chomsky was always on about? Was some, he? Some sort of syndicalism. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Exactly. Do we uh, do we see is. that happening with the internet? Well, where we, the we, hall monitors no, have showed we, uh, up and they're trying to inject. Well, I, I think it's it's actually worse. I mean, the traditional bureaucracies have shown up. Yeah. Uh, and the governments have shown up, and and they are. Uh, the chiefs. We of have all fi hall we finally reached that point that that you know some of us saw coming. 20 years ago, where the the powers that have been will suddenly realize that this that this little anarchist project that the kids kind of put together as a hobby is actually essential to their continued operations, and and they they want to impose themselves on, and they want to impose all the the governmental and economic standards that they've been able to maintain over the last well, in some cases, 2,000 years uh, on this new environment, and. You know, I think it's it's going to be very interesting. But the 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 governance of cyberspace, at least more or less to this point, was a consequence of a govern, government of ideas mm. proposed by engineers mm -hmm. who had a very uh, clear understanding of the political consequences of their actions. That's surprising, actually. Engineers don't well, we we don't were, normally think of them we as were political. Lucky. Yeah, we were lucky. I mean, I, I one time I uh, had a conversation with Paul Barron, the late lamented Paul Barron, who BBN. In, in many ways invented the Internet by inventing packet switch networking right. while he was at RAND. And, and I said, were you, were you really thinking about trying to come up with a, a network that couldn't be decapitated by nuclear attack? That's the, that's the story. That right, that's around. the story. That. And he yeah. said, well, no, I was trying to come up with a network that didn't have a head. There's a difference. Yeah. And, and you know, it gave me this sort of sly smile, like, if you're in on the joke, you know mm -hmm. what I was thinking. And, and, and all of those guys were like that. They really thought about the political consequences of their architectural choices. Network address translation has a similar story behind right. it, right? Yeah, we, we were exactly. talking to a um, physical guy, Bob Frankston. Yep. And he who talks... Has a, who has a great idea for... You know, replacing DNS. Actually. Yeah, we've talked. Actually, yeah. we've talked about him a little bit about, about yeah. well, about, about community. I mean, his internet, is, but his what is his is a little overly complex, I think. <laughs> but <laughs> isn't it, it, the the reason that the internet was able to grow up the way it was is because nobody was paying attention. It was it was it was a system that people were able to play in without oversight. Once people started paying attention, now we've got this bureaucracy. But my hope is that there's always a place where nobody is paying attention. Uh, well, maybe it's, not, it's Tor, it's or maybe it's Usenet, or maybe whether it's... Whether they're paying yeah. attention or not, it's whether they can. Mm -hmm. and, and also, uh, whether the system is open enough to a scaling kind of, of uh, metamorphosis, which it was and has been, so that decisions that are made that seem to make sense and can scale and, and self-duplicate throughout the system, do so. Uh, and I, I, I think we're a ways from anybody being in a good position to do something about that. That's encouraging. You know, Tim Wu talks about this in the master switch, that a, the systems start open like the long distance uh, systems start open, but as soon as there's, as soon as the powers and governments uh, realize there's value here, they, they, they shut it down. They basically monopolize it again. Well, you know... And I've been thinking the Internet uh, may uh, not be uh, uh, like that. I hope if, it's if, not. if I thought that, that there were no danger of that, we would have folded up EFF a long right. time ago. That's, is that really why EFF exists? EFF is there to keep the Internet free. Right. And, and, and you know, to one day achieve our vision that it will be possible for anybody anywhere to know anything that is reasonably well known by any part of humanity and to, and to uh, assist the accumulation of that knowledge with his own right. without interference, you know, that there can be no forbidden knowledge uh, and that, that economics, politics, and jurisdictions don't impinge on that right to know. Do you think we, we teeter on the brink? Well, we've been teetering on the brink all along. Since day one. Yeah. Well, yeah, I remember 93 when Mosaic came out, and I was like, no graphics. That's how you get ads. I don't want that thing. Well, and then after the NSF says you can have commercial traffic on the Internet. Yeah. Well, and there, are, there have been dangerous accidents that took place all along that, that managed to get uh, fixed. I mean, for example, if, if Larry Smarr hadn't been so determined to get Mosaic out of the door, you know, and, and pushed up. Andreessen's project, 
to the point of you know public delivery. Uh, if market had another couple of months to work on it, the web would have been read right from the from the jump. And as That's it was, we had to we had to suffer with a, a read only web, web as as yeah. basically a broadcast medium right. for about ten years. Yeah, Tim Berners Lee wanted to read write yeah, exactly. web. They, and, and and actually, the World Wide Web, as implemented by Tim, was read write was read write. I mean, I it, it was you know read write about. <laughs> theoretical physics, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, somebody showed me the, you know, the heavy lifting version of the web, and I think it must have been ninety. And uh, you know, first of all, I thought, oh Jesus, this is hard, right? And second, all the information on it is something that I'm not sure. Part of I'm, physics. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not ready to assimilate. Yeah, yeah. But you know, you could see, right? Uh, yeah, when he cr created just a. Just for those who don't know, I mean, the idea was it was as easy to modify. It was like yeah. a wiki. Mm -hmm. It was as easy yeah. to modify it as it was to read it. And then it just wasn't because because Mosaic. Mark didn't have four months. I didn't realize that. So he wanted to implement that. Months. Yeah. And he didn't get a chance yeah. to. Right. How interesting. Netscape Composer but, was but, as close know, as the then we came around and, and, and implemented it later. And, and the, the, the problem of having it be, you know, broadcast has been eliminated. Right. Now, again, it's a conversation. Traveler asks in our chat room, should we be more worried about corporate or government interference? Who's the bigger threat? I didn't know there was a difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you, what you should worry about are, are established centers of power. Right. Uh, and, you know, frankly, I think the what you need to worry most about in most cases is the use of intellectual property law for social control, because this is the, this along with child pornography seems to be the, the instrument that right. uh, is politically inarguable among mm -hmm. the masses. And we keep seeing laws proposed right. one after the yeah. other. Although it, that's an interesting comparison because child pornography, yeah, that's totally inarguable. Once you bring that, it's almost like Godwin's law. You, well, you, you bring that up and it know, ends I, the conversation. I, I, not to put in a word for the child pornographers, but... <laughs> <laughs> that's always the problem. You're going to sound that way no matter what. I know. You, you must I mean, be a patriot. Are you, are you still abusing your child? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. No, but I mean, it, 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 Making child pornography in the first place is illegal up front. There's plenty of laws. There, you know, it. child abuse is like right. everybody knows there isn't a jurisdiction on this planet where that's it's okay. not approved of. Uh, and, you know, taking the next step and making information that's generated that way. Right. You know, the, there's a difference between the image and the action. And it's an important difference. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so I, yeah, there's an arguability factor here. I just, I think that the action is illegal enough. Uh, there's sufficient protection. There's sufficient protection. When you talk about intellectual property, though, you have a lot of people expressing one thing and doing another. They may say, oh, yeah, I, su I support those laws to protect copyright, but then they go and infringe it without even knowing it, without realizing oh, yeah. it all the time. And, uh, and frankly, you know, I, I wish they would just get down to the economics because... You know, as we discovered with the Grateful Dead, uh, as we inadvertently invented viral marketing, mm -hmm. uh, being liberal with your so-called intellectual property is, is good for you economically. And, and, you know, people originally would say, well, that worked for the Grateful Dead, but that's definitely a one-off. Uh, but I, I haven't seen anybody who tried it that it didn't work for. Well, and it's interesting when it becomes to the internet, even the folks who benefited from that same procedure in the old medium, like circulating the tapes, changed their mind. I was talking to Trace Beaulieu from Mystery Science Theater at Dragon Con, and I said, hey, you know, I'm one of the guys who used to circulate the tapes, because they would say that at the end of the show, keep circulating the tapes. Mm. And his reaction was like, well, don't do that anymore. <laughs> because well, it's now, the internet. Yeah, now because now, now it's the internet. Well, it's too I mean, easy. I, I actually yeah. had a pretty pretty uh, heated <laughs> argument with other people from the Grateful Dead at one point. Uh, I mean, Brewster Kale, when the Internet Archive first got up and running, people people were downloading uh, or uploading Dead concerts. Right. I mean, immediately. Of course. Uh, you could count on that. Seems natural. And he called me up and he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, Brewster, I think it's better to apologize than ask permission. And let's just see how long it takes my colleagues to find out. <laughs> you know? no, well, they, they did find out, and then they freaked out, and they, right. you know, wrote nasty grams, and and then we had a we had an internal debate, uh, and finally came up with a 
a policy where he couldn't he would he would take down board tapes right you know, the tapes mm -hmm. that we had made ourselves that had escaped into the public but the tapers were okay to but describe. the tapers were okay and you know I, we're still selling uh, albums of board tapes and doing quite well with them you know does Umphreys McGee uh, I'm asking John who's a big Umphreys McGee fan do they uh, allow the board tapes to be distributed or they sell those at the end of every yeah. concert yeah. you get a USB key yeah, exactly. or a CD right. with the, the board tape so if people distributed them they would say no that's not a good thing yeah okay well I don't know that they would no. I mean I know those guys I mean they're They've got the similar uh, they, model. Well, they've got the similar everything. Yes, even <laughs> the music. Know, it's like, yeah. It's, it's kind of more like acid metal, but... Right. You know. Well, right. it seems like the... No the lyrics. Is, that's the problem. <laughs> they need better Well, lyrics. I know. I mean, they, 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 tried to, they tried to get me to write songs for them at one point. I said, well, I don't see where you'd fit lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, we're, I'm sorry. We're space jamming. Yeah. You, you come back later in right. an hour or two. Yeah. But the point there is you sell it to the people who just had the experience. Those are the people who want to buy it. A, a week later, your market has tailed off. Why not let it be circulated well, or, and or promote not. I mean, you know, the... the, the the long tail works better with music than yeah, anything else I can think of. Uh, you know, there are certain there are certain dead concerts that took place in the '70s that are still sure. you know, highly prized among that, tape that uh, Upper New York State, 1974. Yeah, I that mean, was a great show. <laughs> no, it's like that. I mean, it is like that. Like that. I had that gig. Concert. I can't remember the Cornell what, gig. That's the Cornell it. gig yeah. is like really that's legendary. The, one. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. legendary Cornell gig. <laughs> right. I have that one actually. <laughs> well, it's about adapting to the realities of the situation. You can't stop an infinitely copyable medium from well, that, being Well, that was my copied. point. I mean, I, I I wrote about this clear back in '93. Uh, you know, I. I it looked to me like the only reason that copyright worked was because it was hard to make copies. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to manufacture a book. And that was challenging and industrial. But uh, suddenly we were at the dawn of an era where even in, even in 93 it was obvious that, that anything that a human being could do with his or her mind could be infinitely duplicated right. and infinitely distributed at zero cost. And, you know, people will do what they can and will. They really will. So, uh, you know, this notion that, that uh, the powers that have been have, that, you know, the whole thing can be fixed with enforcement and education is, I mean, that's worked so well with the war on some drugs. I can't right. see why they, they, yeah. they uh, think that it's going to work here. Lesson. So what do we do, though? Well, I think we go on. We go on behaving as we would if they didn't exist. Oh, that's interesting. To the extent possible. I Assume mean, that this is going to happen. I mean, and when we try to come up with with our own uh, standards that are based on some combination of morality and practicality. Right. I mean, I, I think that it's it's fairly obvious to all of us when we're doing something that rips somebody off. Mm -hmm. Tim O'Reilly argues that he says, "Don't make a regulation. Don't make a law." Right. For years, we have had taboos and mores yeah. that have governed our actions. You know, right. a lock on a door doesn't really stop anybody from no. breaking into your home. It's a signal that I don't want you in here, and we, and taboos and mores protect you with that. Well, in yeah. fact, a lock on the door can actually be an entice enticement. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not lock it yeah. at all. Yeah, for yeah. Kevin Mitnick, uh, you know, right. a lock exactly. was an entice. Oh, like, how do I get past <laughs> that lock? You know? uh, yeah. But, you know, to, I'd, I'd have to issue a, a reluctant caveat. I mean, I, I was very much of the opinion that that law as imposed by government wasn't going to work in a place where nobody had a jurisdiction and nobody had the capacity to find the perpetrator readily and, and to impose constraint. Uh, and for this reason, we were all going to have to go to the, you know, something like the Code of the West, which was, well, I was gonna coming, say ranchers. From coming from Wyoming. I mean, that right. was, yeah, there yeah. you go. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's why it's called the Electronic Frontier Foundation right. and, and not the Electronic Freedom Foundation. But, you know, I, I'd have to say that, that mores have not been universally successful okay. in cyberspace. I mean, I thought, I thought that the spam problem would be self-regulatory. Just because everybody would say, oh, because, you're oh, it's spam, just, like, I not, Yeah, exactly. Some people don't care what you think. It's a, well, and it's a low percentage response that keeps spam going, and that's the problem. It, it, well, right? it, 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 the, the, the marginal return mm -hmm. necessary to make spam work is so right. infinitesimal. Right. 
uh, that it's still worth worth it to these jerks. Uh, and they're jerks enough not to care what mores they don't care. Yeah. and society say. Uh, and, uh, you know, the same thing applies to malware one sort or right. another. Mm -hmm. Very I, I thought that that would be right. self-regulatory to a greater extent than it has. Well, you need laws. You could put a lock on the door that'll stop most people, but there's a few who well, will try to get yeah. through, and for them you need I, laws and I, law enforcement. I don't think what you need is laws because I don't think they work. Because they can't work. In a uh, frontier, they can't work. And I, I think that, you know, we have been... We have been insufficiently creative in coming up with technical fixes right. for both of those problems. Actually, I think we're getting pretty good on, on both of those problems. We're working. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I've got you numerous, still have big spam problem. Numerous layers of filtration. Yeah, and I still, you know, you just need more filtration. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's like sewage treatment. It's, it's you need a tertiary, it's, it's tertiary fil treatment. Filtering out an awful lot of stuff that I I've want. noticed. Right. I've right. noticed spam becoming less of a problem over the last couple I of think years. It, it hasn't gone away. But about yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it seems like the spammers are finding other means of making well, money you, you in a lot of cases. You don't hear people bitching about the air in Beijing either. They sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe that. Yeah. Maybe it's like boiling the frog. Right. So uh, that's interesting. By the way, that isn't true. The, the, the frog, frog well, he, he will no. jump out. I, yeah. He will jump out. I haven't, no. tried, I haven't tried this. With it's a, a great metaphor, though. I haven't though. tried this with a committee of frogs. I think <laughs> it's possible that a committee... <laughs> we need to, a dozen frogs. John, we can need you get control. me a dozen frogs, a dozen boiling well, we need pots two, of water? We need two dozen frogs. Two dozen? We need a dozen cold pots and then and a dozen boiling pots. see if they pots. don't jump yeah. out. All right. <laughs> We're going to do I, this experiment. I, I think that, you know, that... that uh, That's really funny. That's what I love about conventional wisdom. Don't try this wisdom. at home. <laughs> no, conventional wisdom is so often bullshit, and nevertheless, people just buy hey, it. Sure. Yeah. They, and it's just accepted as... Well, and I'm probably one of the only people that would actually try that experiment. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need that. We need that kind of investment. And I, you know, and I didn't do it many, many times because that really... You did it? No, I, I did try it once. And the frog jumped out? frog jumped out. I love that. <laughs> How slow. <laughs> Wait, no, we, we get, get, get down a rat hole. We, but we digress. <laughs> so we had, we had, one of the things Bob Frankston suggested is that there is an opportunity for community internet run by, uh, uh, in some cases, local government uh, who provides the infrastructure just as they might provide water and sewage. And then on top of the, the internet service provided by a number of companies... You know, or I, even like a condo association. Or I'm, I'm, I'm all for that, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm also a big fan of, of competition as being the way to create right. neutrality. I mean, I and, am the, too. and the only way that I can see. And, I am and, too. Uh, we turn, and we, local, local governance of bit provision has led us into this unfortunate condition where, yeah. I mean, for me, in a relatively it's a duopoly. advanced, advanced. place. Is, uh, you know, I got my choice between Comcast right. and AT&T. That's it. And at and is too slow, and Comcast is censorious. Right. And, where, and you got nowhere to go. Right. It's a choke point. So, choke yeah. points are what cause problems. I, I do remember seeing you talk about this, to, the, even in the board of the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, this debate over how do we solve this net neutrality thing. Go nobody wants government regulation, but on the other hand, uh, these guys aren't going to regulate themselves. Well, and, and, you know, it's even a stickier issue because, uh, you know, a certain amount of bandwidth shaping is in people's best interests uh, in the wireless space. You know, I mean, if you've got an iPhone, even mm -hmm. now, it's, it's still very it's difficult to make a phone call in New yeah. York or San Francisco yeah. because, yeah. you know, your bit... Is that because they haven't invested enough in the infrastructure or haven't been allowed well, to put I mean, enough towers up, maybe? Or? That's, there are a lot of different reasons, but, I mean, they had, a, they had a growth curve that suddenly hit them all of a sudden. Right. And, you know, it could have been fairly easily handled if they could have sorted out which bits could be buffered and which couldn't. Or There's nothing preventing them from doing or that. Or well, you, no, I mean, there is something preventing them from doing that. I mean, so far when they've tried to do that, they've gotten slapped down yeah. by the FCC. Right, that's what Comcast got in trouble right. for. Sure, but exactly. but but the other solution is that competition solution. If iPhone, if every carrier had an iPhone, it wouldn't have been the issue. Yeah. Well, and and also. So artificial scarcity was created. Also, I mean, I guess the government isn't doing much of anything useful these days. But you know, it does strike me that one of the things that government can do is to ward off monopoly. Or duopoly, or concentration well, of, of economic. So you'd energy. agree with the uh, uh, DOJ's shutdown of the ATT T-Mobile? Um, oh, that was 
I mean, that was so transparent. It was a shock that they did it, though, don't you think? <laughs> was very well, yeah, I mean, it was kind were, of surprising that they, they, they had the guts to... That they were, yeah. yeah, I mean, because they, you know... This, this. But what happens to T-Mobile? I mean, the, the, the question here is that can T-Mobile even survive without AT&T? I mean, you can definitely say that it, AT&T shouldn't be allowed to eliminate a competitor, but at the same time, T-Mobile may eliminate themselves. Well, that's... And that's problematic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know... It, the market is not necessarily smart. Yeah. Nor well, the market the market yeah. isn't open for wireless right, right now. That's why right. I've got I've got two hopes. I'd be curious to hear what you think of them. One is light squared. Uh, being What's that? A, they they want to use a spectrum that is right next to GPS to provide satellite based LTE to the entire United States and open it up. They're going to be a wholesaler. Anybody I'll can start it, a right? business on sure. their platform. Problem is the GPS manufacturers are all up in arms because they've been bleeding over into light right. squared spectrum sure. for years. Without well, and, and you have you have built in latency problems that are yeah. Satellite is very late. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But there's ground repeaters involved, so yeah. theoretically that might turn out okay. Right. But this is where a government might have a role. Two, two roles. One is to prevent monopoly, but also to promote competition. Sure. Well, and promote that reasonable competition. Thing. Yeah. What about, how do you feel about Google? <laughs> well, I, you know, I, as I told those guys early on, I said, you know, anybody that says right up front, don't be evil is courting evil. <laughs> You're asking I mean, for trouble. You are just, I mean, like, <laughs> we will be evil. <laughs> You're right. But I take an ironic view of things. Uh, <laughs> I mean, power, it's... it's it a, corrupts. It, it's a, a central axiom. It, it corrupts. Right. right. Uh, and uh, power, it naturally adheres to, to any organization that has so much of the, of the traffic of the Internet flowing through it and is in a position to analyze that traffic in so many different ways. I mean, and, and, and even when they're trying to do good things, which they, they, they are, I mean, uh, they often f find themselves doing things that I find questionable. Right. You know, I mean, for example, there is the, there's the bubble that, that the filter bubble, the yeah, that we are creating bubble. Yeah. around ourselves and, and it appears that they don't even know how to turn that off at this point. Right. You know, because it is embedded in so many of the algorithms. Mm -hmm. There are millions and millions of algorithms that, that uh, are involved in a, in a single network search. They might argue, though, that it's desirable. I mean, that uh, improving... One of the ways to improve search is to make it more relevant, more personal. Well, of course. And, and that's, a, that's a strong argument. Yeah. Uh, Isn't but, that what we want? Well, everybody wants to be told what they want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, you, you know, know Jeff the, Jarvis, it's the great. Stuff that, the stuff that actually matters to me is the stuff I don't you like. You don't to want hear. to hear. It pains you, you know, to and hear. That's, and that's also how science works. I mean, right. science doesn't proceed mm -hmm. by eureka. It proceeds by, God, that's funny. Well, the think, stuff you don't you know, know you want to hear. I think Jeff's, Jeff's point, yeah, if you can move that a little closer, because when you talk to me, it goes, you go off my... Yeah, sure. Jeff's, Jeff Jarvis's point is that, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a specious argument because we are, by the very nature of the Internet, getting so much more information than we ever got before. People have always self-selected in terms of what they read and look at. And now, you can't help it. There's information pouring over you from all directions. Uh, yeah, I want to have the right to know when I'm self-selecting. Yeah. Uh, and it, well, don't use Google or turn, or log out of Google, and then it won't have any and information about you. you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you, you get have the that choice. choice. Whether people will make that choice from a sociological point of view is a good question. A lot of people won't bother. And well, I mean, I feel strongly about it, and I don't bother. So there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so know, there's Google. How do you feel I mean, about? But I'm not John Gilmore. So I mean, how do you feel I, about? Right. Bing? In, in my particular case, you know, uh, laziness overcomes uh, ideology. Right. But, you know, in somebody like Gilmore's case... He cares a lot. Yeah. He'll, you know, he'll walk before he'll... Right. He cares. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about, how do you feel about Facebook? Oh, yeah. <laughs> give, me well, the, give me the good questions. Talk about choosing to be... <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. uh, it is not the global village. It's, it's not. It's the global suburbs. Uh-huh. And... The gated, know, it, the it, gated global it's, suburbs. It's kind of like... Uh, it, it has this quality that's a little like, you know, uh, high fructose corn syrup as opposed to broccoli. I mean, if the well was broccoli. Uh, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you were selling one or the other, wouldn't you want to sell high fructose corn syrup? As long well, as there's sure. a corn I mean, subsidy, I, yeah. I had abs absolutely no sense of conscience. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, 
Corporations don't have a conscience, do they? They're amoral. They're designed I mean, not to have to have a con that's conscience. That's right. And especially if they're corporations that have been created by people that are... Amoral to begin with, but... <laughs> well, I mean, there's yeah. something about Asperger's that sort of works against your, right. your sense of conscience. But, you know, I just... I, I think that, that Google... I mean, that Facebook has replaced real social networking for a lot of people. Oh, I mean, that's I, interesting. I, you know, I have three daughters that are right in the target right. category, and all of them have kind of backed away from Facebook because they, they, they really have an instinct for wanting to be... Actually as social. A, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and this is actually something I wrote about years ago, it's, and it's still, I think, pertinent. It, there's a fundamental difference between experience and information. Uh, I mean... It, an experience has so many characteristics, indefinable and huge characteristics, that are compressed into information, right. no matter how, how broadband that information right. is. I mean, it's like the difference between a cow and beef jerky. Right. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of younger people are saying, wait a second, I'm spending all my time so-called socially networking with people I don't know and never really will. You know, better that I should focus on the people that I do know and hanging out with them and being in, in community with them. Honda's tapping into that. I just saw an ad last night for Honda where the parents were going out biking or kayaking in their new Honda and the kid was staying home saying, oh, mom and dad, they're so old-fashioned. They think that socializing is going out and bicycling. I'm online. I'm with my friends. I'm on Facebook. And, and so there may be... Uh, uh, if if, no, if Honda's doing ads based on that, there may actually be a nerve there that they're no, so they're I, tapping. I, well, Windows, into Windows people know. Ads. We're we're all about Same get thing. back to living your real life because you yeah. won't right. have to waste so much time. So was the well real? We should well, say John well, John was one of the creators the, of the well, the which well, was an online the well, service. Uh, in the the 90s. first of all, had this this quality of, of uh, shared adversity by virtue of the savage user. <laughs> it was the burning man of yeah, online we were, services. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying, to, trying to write anything long was like you know kicking a whale across the beach with your bare feet. But uh, but also, I mean, it was this is now we're showing the whale, but I guess say this, this is, is modern modern day. Day. the well. This is the yeah. modern day whale, which is uh, very yeah, very yeah, different. Yeah. It's, it's well light, but uh, it stood for, stood for but, Whole Earth Electronic Link. Yeah, it was, but it, you know, it, it had a fairly small set of folks who also. Care each other in yeah. in meat yeah. space. I mean, right. uh, there were there were lots of gatherings for well being. Right. Uh, and and there yes, there were many. Uh, there were many that were too far afield to to come to a beach party in in uh, Stinson, but right. uh, still there was enough actual social interaction. So that it, it it felt. It strikes me online communities. This this seems to be very common, where there's a tight initial core group that yeah. it maybe doesn't physically know each other, but has some affinity. Yeah. They kind of self police, and they and then they, it goes wrong. It's well, point. I mean, it, you know, it, 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 what became of the well is exactly what became of Bolinas. <laughs> Bolinas, for those who don't know, is a small northern California town that for years uh, would take the sign down right, on the so road right. to Bolinas. So you don't know where Bolinas is. You we can't are, get there. We are Brigadoon. <laughs> you know? it, is, it, was a, it was a lot well, of hippies. Uh, I mean, and it's you know, a it's wonderful like, place. Yeah. Well, he, sort of. I mean, it's, it's changed. It's kind of like uh, impacted community and a very, you know, right. like impacted molar. Right. But it became very you know, and, right. and the, you know, and the well also became nasty in that same kind of very. It did ugly small town way where you know people would people would uh you get the flame wars in the well there was no there were lynch mobs yeah you know at the drop of a of an ascii character right right is that inevitable do you think in social community i don't think so i mean i think that it's a hard thing to fight i think that communities uh like any other natural system tend to tend to resemble the character of their origins, mm -hmm. you know, and communities that are put together by people who are, you know, basically decent, uh, nice people. We'll stay that way? We'll stay that way. But, you know, there were a lot of people on the well in the beginning that were, you know, were there because they were not socialized. Right. You know, and they looked at... Maybe that's the problem. The Online well communities. Kind of like, like training wheels right. for socialization.
Which online is, communities attract people who are more comfortable online, and right. as a result, they yeah. tend to have these problems. And perhaps. like attracts like. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what always strikes me, is you get trolls in there, and it forces out the good because it gets less and less pleasant. But, I mean, the environment is one where uh, confrontation is non-confrontational. Right. right. You know, it's I mean, safe. The, the people will say things to one another or about one another right. online that they would never consider saying directly to somebody's face. Right. Because, you know, they're not... The likelihood of their getting slugged, you know, in real time, very shortly after making the remark, is <laughs> extremely low. Minimal. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's just something different about knowing that there's going to be a reaction back, whether it's a slug in the face or just a comment. I mean, that, that's one of the, the mainstays now of, of people who do podcasting and blogs is that if you actually react to someone, nine times out of ten, they'll apologize for what they said. Not every time, but but you know more often than you might expect, because all of a sudden you became a real person to them. Right, Jaron Lanier, uh, who was I think a well-being and certainly a big part of the community, just wrote a book called "You Are Not a Gadget," in which he kind of turns his back on technology. Well, I, I think that's a mischaracterization. Okay, good. Tell me what... Tell uh, me. I mean, you know, I... You know Jaron. I, I know Jaron very well, and yeah. one of the great pleasures of my life is that Jaron and I make a regular practice of, of setting aside an afternoon to just sit down and talk about whatever comes to mind, and have done for years, and a lot of the... a lot of the things that, that percolated into his book uh, were his half of that discussion. Uh, Did you take opposite sides? Well, I mean, I'm naturally a bit more uh, optimistic right. than Jaron is, but but not essentially. I mean, I think Jaron's book is very thoughtful about the about the limitations and downsides of of virtualization right. of society. We, uh, and, you know, and, and we've gotten to this point, you know, especially because of the media. Uh, and I don't know whether I'm in the presence of the media or not here, but we aren't uh, sure ourselves. So. Yeah, uh, <laughs> where we're, we're reformed you media. Know, <laughs> we have on the one hand or the other hand, and, and the opportunity to have a, a nuanced opinion that that is, you know, alternately shaking both hands is right. really difficult. Right. So I mean, he's been characterized as being anti-technology when, in fact, he's doing something that I think is important, which is saying, "Oh, here, look." This stuff has its limitations, right? And it, you know, and and it has, it has this capacity to cause natural human uh, abilities to wither in some respect. I mean, it's like Alan Kay talks about uh, auto prosthetics, where you know, something starts out as uh, an extension right. of a human ability, and because of the withering of that ability, thanks to the extension, it becomes a prosthetic. Oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting, yeah. And I think you see an awful lot of that. Yeah. If I, if I remember right, one of the points he makes is that we sort of, we create a technology and then we limit ourselves by it. I think he used MIDI as an example right. of that, which that's is, exactly MIDI right. was a great thing. He wasn't saying MIDI was bad, he's not anti-MIDI, yeah. but we sort of stopped there. And, and all of a sudden, all music was built in the MIDI right. format when we could which be doing so much more. pretty primitive. It. Yeah. Uh, and it was great for what it could do. I mean, the same thing is true now with with sampling sound routinely at 44.1 kilohertz. Uh, you know, it, it, look, reality is, is analog, and that's going to always be the case. Damn it. Well, it's fine. <laughs> uh, but you can... Nick Boster might we, disagree. You know, we, have, we have the capacity now to do samples that are much higher res than yeah. that. You know, I mean, for example, you know, you take a 20,000 cycle sound, which is uh, the harmonics of which are, are perceptible, if not audible, except, of course, your dog. Uh, and, you know, you're only going to have two sample points right. in that sound. Right. Uh, and you need right. more than that to actually have a, you know, a Good real point. shape. So, mm -hmm. you know, we get stuck on these things that become limiting standards for, you know, long periods of time. And, you know, we just need to be more fluid in our standard setting. So he's not saying throw out technology. Oh, he's no, no. I mean, uh, hardly. Just, yeah. you know, remember that there's, there is this other thing. Do you, uh, would you say that you are more focused on the benefits of technology or? I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm grumpier about this stuff than I was back during my, you know, the heyday of my techno-utopianism. Right. Uh, but I expected that to be the case. Right. I mean, I, uh, 
you know, I feel like, you know, it's also true that one way to invent the future is to predict it. Uh, Alan Kay. Oh, uh, he said what to he invent said, it. The best way to the best way to, to uh, predict the future, predict was the to future is to invent it. And right. I think mm-hmm. the inverse is also true. And I, you know, in my predictions, I, I think was, you're right. I, think I was trying to I was trying to create a set of expectations. Uh, in any case, uh, I think uh, you know we've now had enough time to see how a lot of these things are going to work. And I, you know, and I. I will stand by some of the fundamentals of my earlier predictions. I mean, I, I think that, you know, for example, the ability of, of physical world governments to exert sovereignty over cyberspace is still questionable. I agree. The Chinese notwithstanding. I agree. And uh, Well, they pay a price. Let's put it that way. I mean, they maybe are able well, to and do I don't, it. Well, you know, I don't even know how well it's working in China. Right. Well, it's uh, not. It's full of holes. Uh, yeah. I, it's yeah. full of holes, and I think actually many of those holes are intended to be there. Mm. I mean, I... Oh, that's I, interesting. I was involved in getting China online to begin with. Really? Yeah. Mitch and, and Dave Farber and I flew over there to, at, the, at the invitation of the Academy of Sciences in 94 to give a talk on the internet. No kidding. And uh, huh. there was this banquet afterwards, and, and I was seated next to the woman who was the vice chair of the Academy of Sciences and huh. was in charge of the, the intra-Chinese computer networks, which, which put together the five main universities in China. And we'd had a number of fiery toasts, and I was starting to get pretty abstract. And, and I said, before we have another toast, uh, her name was Madam Hu. <laughs> like who's on? Uh, <laughs> Madam Who? <laughs> Matt, before we before we have another toast, Madam Who, I, I want to talk to you about the internet. And she said, "That's good. That's why you're here." And I said, "No, I mean in addition to our speech this afternoon." She said, "That's why you're here." Hmm. And I said, "Okay, I want to see China on the internet." And she said, "So do I." Huh? And I said. Well, if you folks want to be on the internet, why aren't you? And she said, because your Department of Energy won't let us, because they're convinced that if we get on the internet, we'll steal all of your. Uh, way, they might have been all right. Of, all of your, <laughs> they'll steal all of your nuclear secrets. <laughs> they might have been and right. And I said, well, I, I would assume that twenty thousand grad students did a perfectly fine job of that. And she said, of course they do. And besides, you don't have that many. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, and I said, well, maybe we can go back to the DOE and, and do something about Good. this. Which and we, you did. Which we did. Uh, and, Great. And but. Uh, 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 I said, but wait, you know, it, it strikes me that there are people uh, in your government who would have difficulty with giving every student in China you bet. a global printing press. And she said, of course there are, but I'd rather apologize than ask permission. Mm, that's great. Uh, you know, she knew, and, and this is a member of the Politburo. You know, it strikes so me the was, compromise they ended up making was the elites do know how to get around the, exactly. the blocking. And the and elites are getting larger. That's right. And, and it, if you have friend, the right friends, you can, right. Yeah. they're probably still right. concerned about barricades and marches in the street. But as long as the elites uh, you know, are circumspect the, and the masses are un Well, the Chinese have un-informed. a natural and, do, and diminishing fear of the great the cultural outside. revolution. Yeah. I mean, that's the, oh, the that's return the, of that. That's the huge scarring yeah. event in Chinese yeah, history, absolutely. where you've got you've got a sudden cyclonic mm-hmm. uh, accumulation of, of of opinion, yeah. mass psychosis. Yep. Uh, and they they were afraid that that understandably that, that they didn't want that to happen. Could develop again. Yeah. So they they built in a lot of buffers that I think. I have a lot of respect. I think that they've moved close, uh, judiciously. I mean, look, there's plenty of human rights violations, but it's a very big country and a very unwieldy beast. And it's not anything like as, as monolithic as right. it appears to be from right. here. I mean, right. it's a very uh, it's a pluralistic society to a much larger extent than we conceive it. Yeah, we don't think of it that way, do we? No. Yeah. Right. We see single-party system and we right. stop. Right. Yeah. We, right. We, well, that's... You know, well, well, I mean, you know, anytime you got a single-party system, you have di- divisions in that party. Sure. <laughs> well, we have, single party. Well part. we have a single-party yeah, system yeah, have, in the United States have, for all intents and purposes. American corporate yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, are you positive uh, about anything? Are you uh, bullish? What, is, what, do, what do you feel is... Uh, what's the good news? Well, the good news is that things have now gotten so lousy that they can only... <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I mean, this I, is why he's a great lyricist, I, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, <laughs> there's got to be a pony in here someplace. Down so far, so far, look like up to me. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, I, I, I stand directly with Heraclitus, who came up with the idea of an antiodroma 2,500 years ago, and that that is. Uh, you know, the notion that everything is in the continual process of becoming its opposite at all uh, times. Yeah. So, you know, I think things are are pretty dreadful along a great many different dimensions. We've hit one moment. side of the pendulum. But, I mean, uh, any shadow this dark must have been cast by a very bright light someplace. Sure. Do you, do you think so we're we headed need for to a press on? Go to the, one thing go we on, haven't yeah. seen in a long time is a big jump ahead in the internet. Now, I'm not talking about the web or social networking or apps or even phones, but you know we're still working with HTTP and TCP and uh, well, all, they still all the work. Protocols still work. Do you think that we need another jump? Or we well, I don't know that we do. I mean, it seems like. I mean, I think that we need to do something about DNS. Uh, I think that that's that's overly centralized. DNS you know, is broken. I think it's too fragile. Uh, even in a it, you know somewhat distributed state, I, I don't think it's a great idea to have there be one route to right. the whole damn thing. Uh, and I also you know I have I have problems with the the political centralization of ICANN and the extent to which it creates these these large areas of virtual unreal estate. Like the dot triple X. For, yeah, for people. And, and now they're going to be like, you know, a great multiplicity of these. If Anybody. You can, if you can pay for it, you can get if it. You can yep. pay for it. And, you know, and suddenly ICANN's going to be sitting on top of, you know, a billion dollars worth of, of uh, registration fees. What motivated that uh, move? That was a very strange thing. Was it to <sighs> God, get those billion I, I, dollars? No, I don't think that. I think you know that was a that was an outgrowth of their wanting to put up some kind of reasonably high tariff so that they weren't just completely flooded with trivial so they were afraid it would happen anyway and right. they wanted well to no so i mean they, well, they didn't want it to go through a dot triple x every time maybe and we're, say, we're, we're talking about the fact that you can grow your own tld top right. level domain. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so instead of them having to adjudicate everyone they make but it a I, system I, you know i just think i can't see much good that's going to come of it unless you happen to be a lawyer and, and, and There's a lot of things in this country that, that's, yeah. that could be set up, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. including patent law. Yeah. Uh, well, how do you I feel about software patents? You, well, oh, I think it's, I think it's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's really important for law to reflect both both common social practice and practicality, and the way in which patent software patent and patent in general is getting used is to restrict technology, not to grow it. To kill innovation. Uh, it's, to, it's there to, you know, for the the enfranchised right. to squat on the innovators. That's how all and IP law has seems. I mean, copyright yeah. law too. Yeah, but it, that was that's precisely the, the opposite of its original purpose. Right. And so, I mean, I I just think that that IP law in general is a is increasingly a bad idea. But if you say that, and if you suggest we should roll things back, then you get looked at like a child pornographer. I mean, well, but, you know, I just defended child pornographers. So. Yeah. <laughs> he, <laughs> didn't. Know, I, he didn't. He <laughs> didn't. It's going to be in your Wikipedia article, and I don't want to have anything to do with that. <laughs> no, but, I, I mean, seriously, like, the EU just extended their copyright. When, when yeah. all evidence, no, all I mean, rational evidence suggests we should be restricting well, it. Well, fortunately... there studies done that say it would be economically right. beneficial to restrict it to a but, limited period of time. You know, I, I was on this, this bizarre panel... Uh, at the EG8, the, the all right. I meant to ask you about that because uh, there were a lot of people, including Cory Doctorow, who were EG8 dissenters, that said Sarkozy has one agenda only to use your well, names you know, to I, rubber stamp it his was anti pretty internet. Clear what his agenda was, but I, I to civilize the internet. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, I, the irony of that. I mean, I'd written something called Civilizing Cyberspace in 1990, and I meant something very different, completely different. Uh, but. Uh, no, I was. I thought it was great that you went. Jeff Jarvis went. Yeah, I wanted to go. I had to bail you know, we, at the last minute, but uh, we became, you know, a real fly in their ointment. Right. Uh, you know, anything but rubber stamps. But I mean, I, there there was this panel of of sublimely un, uncluful. Uh, you know, the head of Avendi, the head of the head right. of Bertelsmann, mm, the, right. you know, the head Publicis. of uh, the head of Fox. Uh, right. You know, 20th Century Fox. Uh, and they were all, you know, absolutely and blandly convinced that they would get this thing under control according to their 
standards, and you know, I, uh, you were on that panel, and I you? was on that panel, and I, you know, I finally <laughs> came mistake. down to me, and I said, you know, <laughs> guys, we're not on the same planet. <laughs> I remember uh, that. <laughs> and you know, you have a you have a fundamental problem, which is that, you know, by various means, you've created a whole generation of electronic Hezbollah who hate you. Yeah. And they will be alive when you are dead. Mm-hmm. Oh boy! And and the things that that you are trying to impose on them will not work uh, because they you know they get the last laugh. And I still feel that you know I mean I, I think we're gonna w- practice is becoming the what prevails in in spite of. Well, they can realize it now. The European Union's uh, new right. copyright objective, or ACTA, or you know, or the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. I mean, all these things are huge obstacles to the future, but they are not insurmountable. Do you believe in civil disobedience in, in face of those kinds of laws? Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, sure. It's interesting. Larry Lessig says, change the law, don't break the law. But I have to say, I don't have much confidence well, in his ability or our ability to change the law. Uh, yeah, I, at least not before it dies I, I, off. The, the you know, I don't. I don't believe in in questioning authority. I believe in bypassing it. <laughs> you know, I, I I don't I don't think of it so much as being uh, as, as being a law breaker. You just don't as give them the authority. A law ignorer. Right. They believe, don't have the. It authority. sounds like you believe in common law over statutory law. I believe that common law has a way of developing. Yeah. Uh, in a in a much more ductile fashion, well, especially if you have laws as these are, that are that are there to impose uh, the status quo on the future, right. and that's the. I think that's the real issue. It's it's about control, th- and it's about control of the future by the past. The thing I. Um I really love about the EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, which you founded along with Mitch Kapor in, uh, was it 90? 90. 90. Yep. Uh, is that you, it's all about the law. It's all about going to court and, and, and fighting it. It is not all about the law. Okay. Uh, I mean... Then I'm going to take my money back. No. <laughs> no, I mean, we No, have, I'm proud to be a sustaining member. We right? have a bunch of staff technologists, and that, and that aspect of our operation is increasing. That's true. Yeah. Uh, you know, who go to, to technical standard setting meetings mm-hmm. and also propose technical standards. Uh, I mean, we're, right. we're in the process of writing uh, a new system for certification of, um, Good. You know, of key certifiers to yeah, eliminate, need that, eliminate the kind of problem we just Diginotar, had and yeah. with DigiNotar. And uh, there are a lot of ways to address those from a technical standpoint. I mean, we use the law when we can use it. Uh, but from the very beginning, we felt like the law was only going to be useful for a while. Right. It's actually been, you know, we've we've done reasonably well given the fact that we're up against, you know, the assembled mass of, of the entire industrial period. <laughs> uh, you're the you're really John Ludd, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of. With your mallet. <laughs> <laughs> we refute it thus. <laughs> EFF.org. I am very proud to be a, a sustaining member, and I encourage everybody to uh, donate and please uh, do and read and, and, and read. You know, I mean, read. there's yeah. lots what's, to read. What's really important is to find out what the hell's going on because yep. it's you know it's 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 difficult and detailed, and the, and the more we can crowdsource solutions to these problems, the better off we're going to be. Couldn't agree more. John Perry Barlow, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it. And I, it was such a pleasure I came in, and you were here. <laughs> I thought it was another Skype interview. It's so nice to meet you. No, it's a lot It's a lot easier to do this. Yes, on. it is. And we welcome you to our new... It's, it's you know... Anti-media it, media room. The advantage of meat space, once again. It is. There you go. It's nice. We do this show every uh, Wednesday uh, when we can find a victim. I mean, a smart uh, person to talk to at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern at twit.tv. And, of course, after the fact, you can uh, subscribe and get the shows. And there are a lot of shows now. Uh, and two with uh, John Perry Barlow, and I encourage you. We didn't go in great depth into your history and background because we did that in the first. Well, show. you know, I don't, I don't live very far away. Anytime you want me, to, you love having you here. Anytime you want me back, I can, I can drive. Maybe up we'll get you and Jaron up and recreate oh, one of those fun. debates. That would be. We I would know, like to do that. They aren't yeah. really you know, not debates, we discussion. Don't debates, but I mean, you know, Jaron has this remarkably childlike ability to, you know. 
cut the crap and get down to the essence. Yeah. And, you know, he constantly says things that are you know, like blazingly obvious the second that he says them, but nobody ever said them before. Hmm. He's brilliant. Oh, he is. Yeah. As are you, and I'm really glad well, we could get you here. I make a good foil for you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, anytime we get to say Noam Chomsky. We're happy. Noam Chomsky. <laughs> Doesn't come up a lot, I'll be honest. Uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, Tom, thank you. We'll of see course. you next time on Triangulation. Thank you.